How's everybody doing today, huh? Yeah, you need some coffee today, don't you? Well, we're going to bring communion cups and we're going to, we're going to put them down the aisle. And uh, just kidding. Hey, uh, thank you, man, so much for sharing, Mike. Uh, uh, Mike and Pastor Brian did something really bad on Wednesday, and I'm going to tell on them uh, at our Wednesday gathering. Uh, uh, there's, uh, Mike said, hey, here's a piece of candy. Gave me some candy. Um, and he, he, I could see a smirk in, in Pastor Brian's face. Well, it was awful. There's a fruit in Cambodia, and I'd have forgotten this. It's awful fruit is what it is. Uh, it tastes like the armpit of an athlete is what it tastes like. Just to compare the <laughs> compare and contrast uh, there for you. And, and, I, and I ate it, and I'm like, one of those things where I, like, I, I didn't realize I was being set up, or maybe I wasn't, but I was. I don't know. And so good for you guys, one to zero. Bad guys, good guys, right? And, and speaking of candy, uh, we're doing this candy palooza. And I, I just want to go out so I'm not walking on eggshells. Uh, I do believe that, that October 31st is the day that the Lord has made. And, and, and we believe that, that instead of cursing the darkness, we're going to light a candle. And we want so much candy to come in that on, on that morning, on the 31st, uh, we want our kids to like uh, have enough candy for two years. Uh, so, so do that. That's our passion here. Uh, I want our, ch- our kids in this to know that, that, man, this is something powerful and tremendous to them, uh, that, that the church and Jesus loves them and cares about them. And on their level, uh, it's important. You know, back in, the, back in the day, they used to take uh, honey and place it on kids' lips so that they would associate the sweetness of the Word of God with Jesus. Uh, so we're going to put some candy on their lips because we want them to know Jesus is sweet, right? We believe in our kids around here. How many know what I'm talking I mean, I love our kids. It's the deal. It's true, man. That, that's, the, that's the deal. So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of James. What an awesome time that we've been having in the book of James. Uh, I, last week, uh, I mean, we started in a journey there, and, uh, and I asked, what would it, what would it take for you to to believe that your brother was the son of God. And I'm like, they'd take a lot. Uh, Probably nothing. Um, In fact, we see in John chapter 7, it says this, that speaking of Jesus, it says, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. And we know that when Mary and Joseph, after God impregnated Mary, they had Jesus, Mary and Joseph went on and had kids. Uh, they had, you know, and, and James was one of those kids. And, and again, I would ask you, what would it take? And, 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 and probably nothing, except something happened significant in the life of James after the resurrection of Jesus. Paul makes sure in 1 Corinthians 15 that we see, uh, he, he mentions James by name and the other apostles, that Jesus, the brother of James, shows himself to James and now a skeptic, a non-believer, becomes a believer. And what a tremendous story. So it's this that, that we actually read from the book of James. Last week we talked about troubles. Ever had any troubles before? Uh, any, any difficulties? You know, it's like going into one, in the middle of one, or coming out of one. I mean, it's just life. And sometimes we have worse weeks, sometimes we have better weeks. But, but troubles are, 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 are trials or troubles on the outside of us. And we talked about um, just how trouble can really uh, bring our faith into trouble. And I really appreciate James. And this week, uh, we're going to continue in James 1, and we're going to talk about temptations. Because what temptations are, is they're troubles on the inside of us. Let's look at it here. James chapter 1, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is given from above, coming down from the Father of heaven lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be kind, uh, the kind of first fruits of all that he created. Uh, trials, troubles on the, on the outside, temptations, trouble on the inside. In 2001 in India, there was a village that was having major problems with monkeys. 
The, to the point where they were biting people, stealing food, they were creating chaos, eating up their supplies, and it was agreed that the monkeys needed to be dealt with. And so they went to an old method, and they got some old milk bottles, and they tied them to the ground and put a sucker or a sweet, not like your sweet, bro, uh, in the bottom of the milk jug. And so what would happen is these monkeys would go and reach their hand in the milk jug, grab the candy, and make a fist. Only problem was, with a fist, they couldn't get their hand out. And, and so they, they desperately wanted the candy or the sweet so much that even when a captor approached them, they still had their hand in the jar. And, and I'm going to tell you, that's, isn't that true just about, as we talk about this idea of temptation, that it is attractive. But when you begin to not let go of that attraction, it could very much so capture your life. And so James does so well at really keen in on this idea of, of all, all things temptation. Um, have you ever heard the prayer? you ever prayed the prayer? Lead us not a temptation, into temptation. you ever prayed that? Of course you have. It's the Lord's Prayer. It's a part of it. Lead us not into temptation. So I'd ask, who or what leads you into temptation? Maybe it's you that leads you into temptation. You know, Jesus had this mantra uh, while on earth. He said, I, I want you to, to follow me. In other words, uh, I, want, I want to lead you. And, and in our lives, we have a choice on, on who leads us. And look at this, lead us not into temptation. So Jesus wants to lead us. But then look at this. Uh, and it goes on to say that, uh, and deliver us from evil. Or, or, or deliver us, Matthew 6 says, from the evil one. And I would look at it today as, as where and how are we going to deal with temptation. James says, hey, if you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to serve him, uh, he'll deliver you from evil. But if you partake of temptation, it will, it will catch you in the jar with your hand there. It'll ruin your life. So James, man, he talks about it. I want to look at, at, at the text today. I want to give you some ideas of, of his help, James's help with, with temptation and, and four thoughts uh, in, in the text today. Here's the first one, is, is recognize the conspiracy of temptation. Recognize the conspiracy of temptation. I, you know, my, my uh, years ago, I would watch, I used to play basketball and I, my coach would once in a while bring in the VHS and we would watch game film. I mean, that was a long time ago. A, few, a year or two ago, I'm hanging out with my boys and, and all of a sudden I found out how far we've came on game film. Here's my kid, uh, my boys, uh, you know, 10th grade, 12th grade basketball players, and they're hanging out on the couch and they're watching on their phone on an app called Huddle. And it's all the game film of every opponent. In fact, you can go in there and you can circle things on it and they're watching which player to key in on. And I'm like, man, how much sophistication is there over game film? And I'm thinking how, how the enemy watches our game film, doesn't he? And, and we find out right away the source of our temptation isn't God. Look, look at this. Here, here, it is, here it is. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Pretty simple, right? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And I was thinking about this today, and I'm thinking about how trials and temptation and temptations um, the, that there's a similarity there because they have uh, th their origin is the same, but the purposes are different. Uh, all of it is really trouble, and and, and in our lives, uh, trials. Look at this; are designed to define you or to uh, develop you. Trials are. That's why God does it. For the testing of your faith develops perseverance. That's James. But look at this. Temptation is designed to destroy you. And, and oftentimes, it's the trouble, it's, it's the trouble that's the same, and it's, it's the same event that dictates how we handle it to determine whether it's a trial or a temptation. You ever thought about that before? It's pretty, pretty interesting because what we find out is oftentimes the same event can be to your demise or the same event can be to your development. 
Look at, look at this. Here's what I mean by that. Um, what the devil meant for evil, God can make it into good. But what God has meant for good to develop you, the devil can make it evil and, and destruction. The same event can either be a trial that develops you or a temptation that destroys you. Is everybody connected with what I'm saying? Or are you sleeping today? Okay, I, I'm coming. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to package this up in a nice bow, okay? Uh, it, here, here's my point. Adam and Eve, there was a trouble. Here's the tree. Don't mess with it. Don't touch it. Don't eat of it. You can have all the other stuff. Don't eat. That's a trouble. Now, now Satan comes along and he takes the thing that was made to, to develop them and turns it into a temptation that destroys them. Same event, different outcome. S you know, same event, different origins. Same event, uh, trial or temptation. Same event. You connect with what I'm saying? Look at this. Jo Job experiences some trouble. Go and test Job. Uh, that's God to Satan. God sent it as a trial, but the devil tried to make it a, t a temptation. So what I'm, what I'm telling you is, is that when it comes to trials and troubles in your life, or troubles in your life, things that, 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 um, that, that you walk and stumble upon, God wants to use it, the devil wants to use it, and you decide who gets to use it. Right? So, so God has, in, in John 10, 10 tells us that, the, that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, Right? Uh, that's his, his ob objective. Uh, that's his desire for you. But, but Christ has come for you to have life and to have it more abundantly. So, so we have two people, uh, two purposes, one choice, and one destination. Is it going to be a trial or a trouble? Or is it going to be a trouble? Is this trouble going to form trial or is this trouble going to form temptation? In my life, is it going to develop me or is it going to destroy me? And when life is difficult, we may find ourselves complaining and questioning the goodness of God, and finally resisting his will. And I would say at that point, Satan provides an opportunity for you to escape that trial. He is so good. I mean, there's such a conspiracy. He speaks things. Oh, it's too tough. He'll speak about the character of God. He'll talk about the truth of God. Look at it. It's, it's, it's all the way in Genesis to try to distract us and provide a pleasurable escape for us for momentary escape, and it destroys our lives. So James wants you to know and me to know there's, there's a trouble of temptation to do evil that is not sourced in God. In fact, uh, it's a conspiracy against you from Satan to destroy your life. There's a conspiracy. Listen, the enemy is watching game film over your soul. It's amazing how he is patient. It may, may not be this year or next year. It may not be in five years, but he will wear you down to get you to slip into a position of destroying your life. I don't care if you're 50, 60, 85 years old. He is patient. And there's a conspiracy for you to, to succumb to that trial and be tempted in such a way that it would destroy your life and you'd lose fellowship with God. Here's James's second point. Recognize the development of temptation. And, and, and James sh shares uh, the inside scoop of how temptation happens. Um, in fact, the Bible says, I want you to be aware of the devil's schemes. And so uh, James educates us absolutely on the schemes of the enemy. And, and, and the Bible says, don't be aware of the devil's schemes. And we tend to think of sin as a single act, but James says it's a process. Let's look at the text here. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires, desire and enticed. And after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Here, here, here we see that the metamorphosis of evil momentum. Uh, I'm talking about cocoon to a butterfly, but not a pretty one. Like James tips a hand and he says, hey, by the way, this is how it begins. So I want to give you, a, uh, real quick, if you're taking notes or you're on the app um, or you're watching online, five, um, five steps of temptation, five steps to how we get there, right? So, so the first one is this, is you're going to be tempted. That's the step of temptation, right? We're, we're doing the journey. We're walking our faith out. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, or, or, or something begins to, to entice us. And, and I will tell you that temptation is not a sin unless you act on it. You do understand that, right? Because there are certain people, uh, even when I was young in the faith, and somebody said that to me and it set me free because I almost felt like that I was doing something wrong in my faith when I was being tempted. 
In fact, we see that Hebrews talks about, and of course we understand that Jesus was tempted in all ways that we were, yet was without sin. And we understand that, that Jesus was sinless, and so to say that temptation and sin go together is not true. Temptation is sin when it's acted on, right? And, and so I'm looking and I'm thinking about how oftentimes as young believers, or sometimes we can get the idea that what is wrong with me and my faith that I'm tempted? Like, what's wrong with me? And I don't want to turn your thinking around to this idea of it's what's right about you. See, because the enemy, you know, oftentimes if you're not being tempted, that's a problem that you should be aware of. Because oftentimes if you're not being tempted, it says if you're not butting heads with the devil, you're probably going the same direction he is. So I would offer to say the temptation is more of an evidence of spiritual vitality than the absence of it. So we understand the first one is, is that you're going to be tempted. The second one is this, that you dwell in that temptation. And I want to call this the, the, the step of thinking. Um, what would it be like if I, I drank it, smoked it, ate it, touched it, looked at it, slept with it, watched it? What would it be like? And then we rationalize it, right? We're so good at rationalizing it. We justify it. I deserve it. I'm human. I have needs. Blah, 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 blah. We think about it. We're, 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 we're constantly moving around and orbiting our lives around this whole idea of what we deserve, isn't that true? I mean, come on, I'm the best at it, man. I'm so good at it. Anybody else good out better than you? And no, temptation, um, oftentimes it doesn't come at like the front door with temptation on sure, and I am temptation, but it's so conniving and, and it begins so simple and, and, and it's a, it oftentimes begins with a thought, which I, I so appreciate James' imagery here of words. And it really is the development in, in a nutshell of the words that he uses. The first word uh, that he uses here to kind of understand that it all happens right here, that, that really the win and the loss of, of everything in life in regards to the temptation happens right here, is, is that uh, it, he uses the word dragged away. And it's the idea of hunt, a hunter. Uh, I'm so excited about deer season. How about you? Yeah, yeah Lord, come on. Venison for Jesus. And it's so interesting, as a hunter, that the idea is, is to plant things, set things out, obviously in the right season, and all those things to create an environment where, where the, the animal loses and resists the safety to come and, and be found right in front of you, right? I love the, the idea of this idea of being enticed. And, and, and another one is, is uh, the word actually... Uh, it, is enticed, and, and it's a second picture of imagery here of the lure or a fisherman. Um, I, I, people ask me to go fishing. I hate fishing. Hate it. I mean, I, I get so I can sit in a deer stand for a couple hours, but man, I will. I will. I, you don't want me going fishing with you. I'll be paddling in the water. I'll be swimming. I'll be. I mean, it, it's just not good, right? Playing like Angry Birds in the boat, too loud, scaring all your fish away. You, you don't want me. That. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, here's the, it's the lure piece. It's the fisherman. It's, it's grabbing your attention. It's all in your mind. Here's the other phrase is conceived. It's the picture of a womb, of, of sinful intimacy, or infancy rather, potentially maturing and being strong, right? All three images begin in this idea of thinking and what you allow in your thinking. In fact, here's what the Bible says. Take every thought captive. That, that I want you to understand how big of a deal your thinking is. It's so true. I mean, our, our thinking, as a man thinks, so is he. And, and, and listen, I understand we, we, we look at the world's idea of self-help and positive thinking sometimes as, as kind of this all self-made. But I want to tell you there is some power in the way that you think. There's a massive argument over the real estate of your mind. So the thinking, there's a good, uh, here, here's this, the next step. You start moving towards sin. I call this the step, the step of tipping. It's the, the, the idea of moving towards it. And, and you don't stop thinking, and now it starts to snowball. And, and I'll, I'll say this. This will kind of give you an idea exactly what I'm talking about. Long before you sin with your hand, you sin with your heart. And this is a dangerous place because maybe today perhaps as you're watching or you're listening that maybe some of you are here. It's the place of almost virtual, a place of no return. 
the decision virtually hasn't been, has, has been made, but yet it hasn't been acted out yet. It's, it's this, the empowerment of the thinking into deliberating on how it's going to be done, where it's going to be done, what's it going to look like. And I want to tell you, if you're there, step away from it. Because there, you're, you're still in a place where it, it's, oh, it, it's like halfway suspended between uh, temptation and sin. It's, it's close. It's probably there. But there's not a lot of destruction in your life yet. You can still back up. You can still repent. You can still keep character. You can do this if you stop now. And, I, and I'm like passionate because I believe from moment to moment and from, and from experience and gathering in churches to each service, man, that there are people suspended in this. And I want to challenge you today to stop it, quit it, get your hand out of the jar, right? Here's the next step is you actually sin. This is acting on temptation. You pull the trigger, you say, yes, you do it. But here's what's also cool, because I want to infuse, just along with these schemes of the enemy, I want to infuse grace in your life. Because the Bible says in Proverbs that a righteous man has fell seven times and gets up again. And that, that, listen, Christ is, is, is not looking to, to, uh, to discard you, but he's looking to embrace you. He sympathizes with your weakness. And even if you're in this moment of sin, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to purify you from all unrighteousness. I want to tell you that God's grace is bigger. Man, that's a good moment for an amen. Right? It's a big deal. And Hebrews 4.16 says this, let us approach the throne of God's grace boldly and find mercy in our time of need. It's the step of sin. But here's the last step is that you die. It's not on any, any uh, packaging of that temptation. The enemy surely doesn't want you to process the death of what you're going to do when temptation turns to sin. And... And I look at that and I'm thinking it's when it's fully grown, the Bible says it gives birth to death, death emotionally, death relationally, death spiritually, death to your character, death to your marriage, death to your finances. And, and James is pleading with us to save us from that. He, he's tipping the hand. And, and, and here's what Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So James is absolutely um, for our success against temptation. And I think sometimes it's beneficial to us to push the fast forward button on the sin DVR, right? So, so in other words, what would it be like for, for you to, uh, to sin? Like what, what are some questions as you, as you add 10, 10 years or as you add five years or as you add maybe five months to what you're about ready to do, what, what's that gonna mean for your relationships? Like, what's that going to mean for your character and your reputation and, and to your testimony? What, what's that going to mean? Uh, well, what's it going to be like if you get caught? Well, what's it going to be like if, if um, you have to, to tell your spouse? See, in my mind, I can tell you over 23 years of marriage, man, uh, there's, there's always temptation. The, the enemy is so good at always putting something in front of you. And there's so many times over in my mind, I'm playing it out sitting down with my boys. I even kind of get the idea of, of it being on the couch and what would it be like to bring them in, them not knowing what I'm going to say and it destroying their life in some way or at least it, their outlook of their dad. Sending them down and saying, boys, I want to tell you, I was unfaithful to your mom. See, now all of a sudden, the sin that looks so glamorous isn't that attractive anymore. I want to challenge you to think about the death that it'll bring into your life. And James says magnify. It's almost like this idea of magnify the effects of your sin before it's too late. And maybe some of you are here and you're, you're, you're thinking about that. I'm, I'm praying. I don't know. I just feel so compelled today to plead with you to plead with you so that it can d develop you and not destroy your life. Here, here's this, the third. James, James helps us to recognize how to win against temptation. And look at this. Um, James goes on. It seems like it's a new topic, 
but it isn't. He says, don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Uh, and when you're in the middle of temptation, we must realize God has some gifts and things to help us out. That every good and perfect gift is given from God above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. See, I love this because it points to the fact that it looks like it's a new topic, but I love the idea that, that James is saying there's some gifts that you and I have that were given by God because God cares about our success in living right. He just doesn't demand that you live right, but he gives you the power to live right. That, isn't that fun? That, that he doesn't demand holiness from you and, and for you to, uh, to not drive your spiritual car into the wall, but he gives you all the equipment and all the necessary stuff for life and conduct to make it with Jesus. He doesn't give me something that's impossible, but he gives me something to help me succeed in that which he asked me to do. He's got gifts for you, gifts to help you out in this moment. And look at this, Paul says it great in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. Stop. Look at this right here. Look, look, we're going to read in a minute, but I want you I want to marinate on this. Do you, have you ever felt like I'm weird when you're tempted? Like, man, I'm just an odd, am I the only, maybe I'm the only one, weird one here, I don't know. But, but I'm like, man, you know, I feel so odd. And, and it feels, so, you know, like I'm the only one that's ever been tempted. Oh, in this, what's my problem, right? I'm so, I want to be successful, God. I'm so weird, so deranged. But can I tell you this? Hell has no bag of new tricks. Like they're, they're manufacturing the same old sins with different paper. I mean, listen, isn't that encouraging that, that there's no temptation that, that you experience that hasn't been experienced before? Isn't that encouraging that because they conquered it and they won, I can conquer it and win in my own life? That's awesome, man. And, and I feel better when I don't feel like an oddball. When I hear that you've been tempted like I'm tempted, baby, I'm boom shakalaka all day with that. Because there's a sense of encouragement, but that I'm not the only one. Because sin or, or the desire to sin has this ability to isolate us. We start talking to people. We, in a safe environment, we realize, oh, you, you oh, okay. And, and all of a sudden, the, the clamor of, of, that, of that next step into sin from temptation, uh, now all of a sudden it loses its power because hell it hasn't done anything new and, and the results aren't anything new. And so what a great truth, no temptation. And God is faithful, I love that. And he'll not, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Hold on a second, right? Do you know how strong temptation can be at times? I mean, it is, it's crazy strong. But if it came to you, it must mean that he believes in you. If it came to you and, and you're being tempted, God must think enough about you to believe that you can handle it and in him you're strong enough. So instead of sulking, what you need to do is look in the mirror, put your shoulders back and start speaking truth in the mirror about who you are and whose you are and that if God believes in me enough to conquer this, then I know that I can get through this because of him. Man, I love that. It's a, God is, and, and, but when you're tempted, look at this. He'll also provide a, a way out so that you can endure it, or way escape, an exit sign. You know, isn't it funny how uh, you, when you're in the midst of temptation, I mean, there's been moments that, that, that I'm in the middle of temptation. I'm getting ready to pull the trigger on sin. And, and all of a sudden, uh, the phone will ring, and it's my dad, or it's my friend, and it's like this, this, this exit sign. Or I'm getting ready to pull the trigger and do something, and, and all of a sudden, my, my boy will cry from the other room. Or, or like something, I mean, I've had like weird stuff happen that'll just shake me to reality. And isn't it cool that alongside every temptation that you will find if you're looking for it is an exit sign. An exit sign, it's lit up, it's obvious. Here's the way out, because that's what God does. And some are like, well, I just never seen an exit sign. It's because you're fixated on the sin, right? So, so there is an exit in our lives. That's how James tells us to win against temptation. Here's the last one. Um, there, there's always an exit. Look for it. Here's number four. James helps us to recognize strength in choosing truth. 
The good news is that this is not about your strength to gut it out, to like grit your teeth, to white knuckle this issue that the final gift that God has given us is his truth. Like a truth that, that is prescribed on how we live. It's, it's powerful. Here's what it says that he chose to give us birth, that's salvation through the, the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now, I've been really frustrated with this text simply because I want to explain it to you the way that, that it says without having to take 20 minutes to give you a theological explanation. It says the word of truth, and so we understand that in this text, it's Jesus. But we also understand, is it Jesus or is it the written word of God? And the answer is yes, both. See, because what we have to understand is, is uh, when, when it comes to Scripture, And truth, it's all about Jesus. In fact, John said it this way, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So there is an incredible connection between the word. And let's be honest, the word is all about what he said, Jesus, what he did, Jesus, and who he is. Genesis all the way through Malachi speaks of what Jesus is and who he is when he comes. And then we look at the New Testament points back in so many ways to the cross. Old Testament to the cross. New Testament back to the cross. It's all about Jesus. So we understand that when we read this, the word of truth is Jesus, but it also in so many ways is is the truth of written word of Scripture. And, and, And what we begin to understand is that as we read about Jesus, you live according to the truth. So it's the word, is the word Jesus or is it the Bible? Yes, the answer is both. So, and I, and I find that when I recognize the truth, the truth becomes, it becomes the, the, the health of my life, the strength when I live according to the truth. Here's how Galatians says it. When, when you walk according to the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Here, here's how one Native American chief of, of a village said it. He, he had some boys that were talking about the internal struggle within. And he says, you know what, guys? The, talking to these young men, he says, there's, there's two dogs in you. There's one dog that wants to do good and one dog that wants to do bad. And sometimes it feels like the, the dog that wants to do good is, is stronger and sometimes the one that, that wants to do bad is stronger. And he says, you know which one ultimately wins? And the boys were looking at him like, what? And the chief says, it's, it's the one that you feed that wins. And see, as we begin to feed our lives into the written word of God, about the word of God, we begin to establish truth and we begin to establish strength against temptation. It's the strengthening of our spiritual immune system. See, truth is the immune system by which I fight off the disease of temptation. The truth of our lives, right? And so we become stronger by feeding our lives the word of truth, i.e. sidebar Jesus, relationship with Jesus. How do I know Jesus more? You get into his word. See, that's what's awesome is, is the reason the word of God is so important to you is because it adds to the truth of your life. It feeds the good dog inside of you. So I look at that and I'm like, you know, it's exactly what, what Jesus did. He's, when it came to temptation in his own life. Remember in the, the wilderness, 40 days he was tempted? Satan came to him and says, hey, turn this stone to bread. And then what did he say? Jesus said, it is written. The man shall not be lived by bread alone, but by every word of God. Two other times, hey, Throw yourself off this cliff. And Jesus said, what did he say? It is written. And then he says, it is written again. You see, it's not just about knowing the truth. It's about doing the truth. And that when you begin to walk and understand the truth, everything else that is generic starts to lose its its strangle on your life. See, see, there's such a power in the word. And and I love what, what, what old preacher said. This old preacher said this. He said, if the living word needed to use the written word to deal with the enemy of the word, how much more do you and I who have never written any word need to use the same word to deal with the enemy of the word? that true? So I look at that and I'm like, you know, put Jesus on every day. The word of truth on 
every day. Get into your scripture every day. Don't read it to check the list, but read it to know the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is truth personified. The word became flesh and dwelled among us. And and I'm like, that's such a a mind-blowing reality. How those two in sync Jesus and the written word provide truth to my life to help me have strength, to strengthen my spiritual immune system so that all the temptations of the enemy can bounce off my soul as I maintain health before God. So no wonder James says this in verse 21. He said, you know, get rid of all moral filth and evil that's so prevalent and accept the word planted in you which can save you. That's the deal. It's the word, gang. It's the word. It's not because it's so cute and it's a church thing that we read the word. It can save your life. Look at this. Here, here's what also what he says in verse 22. Don't just listen to the word, but do the word. Here's the next thing. Verse 25, he says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. What's the perfect law? It's the word. And continues it. And I love it. Trials. Troubles on the outside, temptations, trouble on the inside. The same event oftentimes can destroy you or develop you. And guess what? You know what's interesting is we we got the power to choose. See, God wants to use it, the devil wants to use it, and we get to choose who uses it. You know, there's a guy, uh, one of the biggest con artists that it was ever in the history of of the United States. His name is George Parker. In fact, uh, George Parker, uh, he set up an office in New York City and sold some of the city's most, like, famous attraction to tourists. Like, he, uh, his favorite was to sell was the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, He sold the Brooklyn Bridge. He made these elaborate documents that you would pay him money, and he would give you a document, like a certificate of title, to show that you bought the Brooklyn Bridge. And he also did the, the, the Madison Square Garden, the Statue of Liberty, and, and he produced these deeds and, and convinced his targets that they were the rightful owners of the landmarks he was selling. And then something happened. The police came when someone who bought the Brooklyn Bridge decided to put up toll booths. And they said, you can't do that. Well, we own it. No, you don't. And I'm looking at how the enemy, man, he's so good at selling things to us. And he's so good at at getting us to to buy into things. And I want to tell you, don't you buy it. Don't buy it, man, because your life depends on it. You know, I love Joseph who had major temptation in in chapter Genesis 39, but he didn't buy it. And, And man, there was this lady that was after him. It's Potiphar's wife, a married woman. And he even said in, in Genesis 39, verse, uh, verse uh, 9, he says, man, uh, talking about, man, there, that, that if I do this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sinning against my, uh, my boss but you, and, and, because you're his wife. But, but then he says this, that how can I do such a great wickedness and sin against God? And I'm looking at that, and I'm like, God is truth. Truth is defined by him. Listen to me, in a world that that doesn't know truth, that doesn't want to adhere to truth, it's not about what you feel that's right. It's not what, what you think is right. It's not what culture says it's right. It's what God has prescribed as right that is right. And I love that he said that. He brought the attention that this is, an, this is against God. Here's what else he did. He says, and then, uh, she spoke to Joseph day after day, and, he, and look at this. He refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. I'm looking at that, and I'm like, listen, if you don't buy it, you know what? If, if you can't do it if you're, if you're not around it. He didn't even hang out with her. He, he constantly stayed away from her. How many times do we, do we flirt with the idea of temptation because we continue to entertain it instead of just bailing out? The Bible says flee sexual immorality. It also says, man, don't just like, in Hebrews, it talks about don't, don't uh, throw off the sin that so easily beset you. One, one translation says set it aside. I like to throw off because so many people set it aside and they pick it up again. But Hebrews is like throw it off. Get it away from you. Treat it not like some cupcake, but like a poison in your life. And then the last thing, I love this. Um, 
one day she comes in and he's there, caught him in the house. And she said, come to bed with me. But look at this. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. The, hey, baby, if Forrest can run and Joseph can run, so can you. I love it. Run. That's the attitude towards temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver us from the evil one. I want you to grab your Connect card. Um, in a few moments, um, Pastor Jake, dude, good job today, by the way. I'm so, like, I have to pinch myself that we have, like, Pastor Jake and Pastor Emma doing our, our, our you do our worship on our, on our, in our youth ministry, and Pastor Emma and youth pastors, this, like, Batman and Robin team. We're, we love you, dude. You're, I mean, I, we, this is a gift to our students, right? Come on. That you don't have to drag your life as a student through the mud, that the best testimony that you can have is that, that, that troubles in your life can develop you, right? So grateful for you. Love you, man. He's going to lead us in a little bit of worship. Grab your connect card. Let's go through these real quick. Um, and, and just be prayerful about these. Take a next step. Put them in the blue bins out there. They're not for recycling. They're for these babies right here. I was so proud of you last week. For many, I mean, we had a ton last week. Let's continue to do that. Proud of you. First one is this. Today I accept Jesus in my life as, as my Savior, right? You know, I think about James, who was a skeptic. Then he became a believer. And that maybe you've been a skeptic. And do you understand the resurrection is proof positive that Jesus is who he said he was? That's why this whole resurrection thing is such a big deal when it comes to all other religions. Is, is that, that because it's a difference maker if it's true. And it is true. It changed James's life and it could change your life. And maybe you're watching online or you're wondering, is this the right way? Or can God do anything? Yes. Number two is I have a trouble and, and desire to find the exit in the, my temptation. He thought I'm in the middle of it, man. You know, I'm not, I'm not in the sin part yet, but I feel it, and, and, and I need prayer, and I need prayer for strength in my life, right? Here, here's the third one. Um, this is our, in October, we talk about our one more movement. And, and we've asked you just in the sense of taking what James was passionate about, which is Jesus, around the world, Right? And, and, and it's just by saying, man, praying about it. I'm not a manipulator. I can't stand when it comes to finances. I can't stand it. And, and maybe I'm not a great money raiser. Or, or someone who's like, man, give the missions. Because I, I'm just, I'm not going to like manipulate people. But here's what I am going to do. I'm going to ask you to pray about it. I'm going to ask you to pray beyond your normal giving. What can you give? In the, next, in the next year in 2022. And what that means is, I think about it this way. Every dollar I give is a soul reached. It's just because I'm simple, right? I don't know if that's true or not true, but every, every dollar I give to the one more movement is one more that comes to Jesus. So pray about it. And, and would you, would you put, do something? Can you, 10 bucks a year? I mean, I mean seriously, 10 bucks. Like the, all of you, you got 10... Dude, I would love to see everybody do something. Everyone, if it's 10 bucks, 10 bucks. If that's what the Lord said, I, I just like to see, because here's what it's about. It's about what generosity does in me and not always what it does for me. Yeah, see, that's the Lord calling. He's saying, fill out your faith pledge. <laughs> hey, just answer it, Dan, and say, yes, I will. You know, that's good. <laughs> the next one is this. My next step is, and maybe even praying and you have a next step on your own about what God would say to you today. Be doers of the word, not yours only. So I want you to stand with me, fill these out. Um, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come. Let's just sing this response song to the Lord, uh, and then I'll come back and dismiss you, okay? Let's just really pray. God, what do you want me to do in my next step, Lord? And, and I'm just going to check that, I'm, and I'm going to believe that I'm walking in truth. Let's worship together in response to what God has done today. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say I am. Yeah, that's good. You ground me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has gone. Feel my champion 
It jogs for when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won, I am, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. So when I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority, yeah, that Jesus has given me. So when I open up my mouth, miracles stop breaking out. I have the authority, yeah, that Jesus has given me. So when I lift my voice and shout, every war comes crashing down. I have the authority, yeah, that Jesus has given me. So when I open up my mouth, miracles stop breaking out. I have the authority, yeah, that Jesus has given me, yeah. You are my champion, hey, giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. So, Father, we, uh, we desperately love you. You've given us everything we need. God, you're our champion. God, it's all about your victory that you provide for us. We're not fighting for victory, but from victory. In Jesus' name.